welcome to the Black Voice Hertfordshire Community Meeting. Our speakers tonight are Sue Mingwala, Dee Ma, Alex Graham and Clive Saunders. To find out more about the Black Voice Hertfordshire Community Meeting, please view the chat now. To note our house rules, please view the chat now. Speakers Collaborations Volunteers, we need you. Email us at blackvoiceletchworth at gmail.com. To find out more about Black Voice Letchworth, please view the chat now. Our two main aims are to fundraise for the UK's first Black History Museum, Library and School of Cultural and Creative Arts and to support the Black community. Please note our socials in the chat now. Our online services include Kids Gaming Group, more our BVL radio show, Funky Ma, our parent and child fitness class. Mama Sugar Shakes, our 0 to 5 preschool program. The Black History School. Mental health support. Legal advice support. Accountability dossier. Alcubalan Festival Hate Crime Reporting Centre Employment Support Computer and Internet Support The BVL Magazine Short Films and Documentaries Online courses, private function entertainment, online Saturday events monthly. Please note our donation information in the chat. Save the date, Friday 25th of June is our next Black Voice Hertfordshire community meeting. Working together for change. Our Black Voice Letchworth team welcomes you and we hope you enjoyed the meeting tonight. Thank you. Good evening everyone and welcome to the monthly Black Voice Hertfordshire community meeting for May 2021. Firstly, we have some updates. PC D. Ma, who was supposed to be speaking tonight, is unwell. Uh, she has placed a representative from the Black and Asian Association to speak about Black people working as police officers in her stead. And also, Councillor Sue Nguala um, sends her apologies, but she will not be speaking tonight either. Uh, our fundraiser for the St. Vincent Volcanic Eruption will take place tomorrow, so please book your place if you haven't already. Black Voice Electric jobs are available on our Facebook play page, so please check that out, and I'll mention more about our socials later on. We are pleased to be hosting many leaders in the community, as well as members of the public tonight. We also extend our gratitude to the speakers that we have, including a representative from the Black and Asian Association, Alex Graham from Heckford Norton Solicitors and Clive Saunders from the Watford Afro-Caribbean Association. In today's meeting, we will be discussing productivity, leadership, authority, health and employment. Before we begin, here are our house rules. Firstly, please remain muted at all times. Please use the virtual Zoom hands up button to give notification that you would like to contribute or write your question in the chat box. Due to the specific nature of this space, please refrain from using any and all known and unknown ethnic group acronyms and words. Please wait for a contribution to end before you contribute. Raised voices over a contribution are not permitted. Please do not swear or use foul language. Please place all contact information, events, projects, etc., of your organization you wish to share with us in the chat. Black Voice Letchworth is on many social media platforms. Please come and connect with us. We are on Facebook, Tumblr, Pinterest, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and LinkedIn under the name Black Voice Letchworth. 
on Snapchat and Twitter with the username at BlackVoiceL. And we have a website at www.blackvoiceletchworth.com. Our contact number is 07581 720032. And our emails are blackvoiceletchworth at gmail.com and bvlinquiries at gmail.com. All of the places where you can find us online will be posted into the chat. A link to a form where you can provide feedback about the Black Voice Hertfordshire community meetings will also be in the chat. And if you don't receive our reminder emails for Black Voice Hertfordshire on the minutes and recordings of these meetings, please feel free to use the other link in the chat to tell us your email address. This is not mandatory, but there are quite a few people who attend that we don't know how to contact. If you would like to donate to BVL, our PayPal is blackvoiceletchworth at gmail.com and our fundraiser is at www.blackvoiceletchworth.com but this information is also in the chat. Thank you and I will now hand over to our first speaker which are the representatives, sorry um, I don't know your names yet, from the Black and Asian Association. Are they here? No, no. it doesn't seem like they are. So no. <laughs> we'll move on to the next. <laughs> so in that case, we will move on to Alex Graham from Hexford Norton Solicitors. Solicitor. Sorry about that, everyone. Well, I didn't think I'd be first up, but I'll take my chance while it comes. So good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, firstly. Let me say thank you very much for having me and uh, for inviting me. Um, to be part of, of this event. I, I feel very privileged and very honoured to be asked to speak, not only on behalf of Hector Norton, but also to our local community as well and members of our local community. So thank you very much. Uh, I will start also with a confession, which is that the slideshow that you're about to see has been designed by uh, a, a much cleverer lady than I will ever be, and that's my nine-year-old daughter. So um, she will take the credit um, for, for that. I would just be the voice uh, behind her inspiration. Um, so I, I think I get to be like one of those scientists now that say, Amy, first slide, please. Um, so just to give you a bit of background in terms of Heckford Norton Swisters, we are, um, we have been going since 1919. I'm not that old. I just, uh, I might look it. I've had a hard day and a hard week. Um, but our firm is uh, based in Stevenage, Letchworth, and in Saffron Ward in Essex as well. Uh, that tree that you see is designed not only because it looks very nice, but it's to show that we have our roots in the community. Uh, and I think that's something that we all, um, whatever communities we're a part of, that's something that we all um should try to embed. Uh, Amy, I think I'll, uh, we didn't work out a hand signal to move to the next slide, so I'll, I'll just keep asking you very nicely. So Harry Heckford was a person who um, created Heckford Norton Solicitors uh, in 1919. We celebrated 100 years, a few years ago now, in uh, 2019, where the world seemed uh, a lot different than it does now. Uh, it only took five minutes for somebody to drop coronavirus into the conversation. So um, if you had five minutes in the sweepstake, uh, you win. Uh, and we are based in Stevenage uh, off Letchmore Road in, near the old town in, Letch in Letchworth uh, on Lays Avenue and in Essex as well. So you can find us in your uh, whatever area is local to you. We are not just a uh, solicitor's firm um, that is a fly-by-night firm. Uh, we have been around, as I've said, already for quite some time. Uh, our client base keeps returning to us because we put our clients first. And we're proud uh, that, uh, whether that is Mrs. Smith, who lives around the corner, uh, or a number of companies who are um, working and operating in the Hertfordshire area, um, that we, we try our very best to help everybody. Uh, Amy, uh, if you can uh, flick along. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag. So what we do, well, we have a lot of bright ideas as the light bulb um, 
will reflect. Um, we can help our local communities with wills and probate. Lasting power of attorneys, which are becoming increasingly more popular. And I always get people say to me, well, I don't need one uh, because I'm, not, I'm fine, I'm fit and healthy. And, and of course, um, if anything should happen, um, that is when people need them. Uh, residential property, buying and selling houses, which has become um, somewhat busy. Um, if uh, you've heard of the uh, stamp duty holiday, Commercial property, uh, businesses on the high street, employment advice, which is something that I do um, and have been doing for a few years now. Uh, family and divorce, which is uh, something I definitely don't do, um, but uh, one of our other partners does. And crime, which is something that I do. Um, and uh, if you're asking me, I would argue that that's probably the most interesting one uh, because I get to go off to the old Bailey and dress up and uh, argue cases in front of judges who uh, are quite scary. So we cover a wide range of legal services. Uh, we are, as I say, able to help the majority of people in our local communities uh, with whatever their uh, legal problems are. Um, our partnership is uh, wholly experienced, um, as are most of our employees. Um, so I can often say with certainty that if I can't help you, I can put you in touch with somebody who can. Uh, thank you, Amy. If I can ask you to click along. So our website there, uh, uk, uh, and our addresses and contact details there. Pop by, have a cup of coffee. Well, once upon a time, I could offer you a cup of coffee. I Hopefully, we'll get back to that pretty soon. Um, but uh, I would say, please don't hesitate to contact us if we can help any of our members of our local communities. Uh, and even if somebody wants to speak to me directly um, because they've seen my face, I apologize in advance about that. But uh, if, uh, if anybody does want to come through to me first, um, then of course I'm more than happy to put anybody in touch with uh, the relevant department or people who can help. Them. Um, I think there's uh, a couple more slides, Amy, just to, uh, So one of my favorite phrases uh, that I had to have on this slide is, trust me, I'm a solicitor. And it's really just to emphasize that, uh, that you can trust us. I know there's a, a lot of sometimes skepticism about lawyers and things like that. And we understand that, but we hope that being part of our community in Letchworth, where we originally started and branching out to Stevenage in 1959 and in uh, Essex as well, that we, we feel that we can be trusted with, with the lives of, of those in our uh, local surroundings. So thank you very much for the time. Um, I don't know if that's been 10 minutes. Um, if it's been under 10 minutes, then um, you're lucky because I have a tendency to go on. Uh, I'm often told by my employees to, to stop and be quiet. So uh, if it's under 10 minutes, that's a good sign. And uh, the last slide, I'll just say there, that's, that's my daughter's slide who, who wanted to uh, quite rightly take all the credit for what you've seen today. So I hope I've done it justice. Thank you very much. As I said earlier, I feel really pre privileged and honored to talk to you this evening. And uh, I, I don't know if I say, throw, I'll throw it open to the floor, uh, Michaela, Amy, but uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to try my best to answer them. Thank you very much. Um... Alex for that presentation your daughter did a very good job she, <laughs> uh, she, she did I, I, I'll tell her you said that Amy you should be delighted <laughs> uh, usually we do all the talks first and then we do questions uh, is that what we're feeling today Michaelia uh, yes we are yes so uh, let's have I'll, go back, I'll go back on mute then thanks thank you very much <laughs> thank you so we go straight to Clive don't we yeah Thank you, Clive. Ah, good evening, everyone. Sorry, I I thought I'm way down the line, but it looks like um, um, I've uh, um, my, my my long straw has become a short straw. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for inviting me to join you this evening. Um, my name is Clive Saunders. Um, 
I wear a number of hats and um, uh, Alex, you might um, not know, but well, you wouldn't know, but uh, uh, I'm sometimes on the other side of the bench when you're in court, but probably not in your court because I'm a magistrate. Uh, the, I'm clearly ch chair of the Watford African Caribbean Association, and uh, I'm also actually uh, currently one of the chairs of uh, uh, our Black Asian uh, Minority Ethnic Network in across Hertfordshire. So I'm very pleased to be here. Um, now, um, am I able to share my some slides I've got? Okay, so uh, let's just uh, do this. Okay, so uh, let's see if this will. St Are you still seeing this? Yeah. Okay, so um, Watford. Uh, so I'm here really to talk about um, our sickle cell and thalassemia support group that we have within the Watford African Caribbean Association. Um, and so just by way of a, a bit of background to this, uh, some of you may be more familiar with some of this than I am because I'm actually not a, a clinician. I do do some work with a mental health trust, but uh, um, the clinical work is done by others. But uh, uh, as chair of the organization, I have an, an overview of the sort of issues that we cover. And that's what I'm going to share with you uh, today. Uh, so um, uh, sickle cell and, uh, and thalassemia are uh, very serious uh, hereditary blood conditions. Um, and uh, basically, uh, the disorders uh, mean that the condition impacts on the, the, the shape uh, of the blood cells, uh, particularly when um, there is a, 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 let's say, a crisis occurs, which prevents the normal movement of the blood around the body. Um, if you, if someone has uh, either one of these conditions, uh, it means that uh, they would have uh, gained this from both of their parents. It's, you, you can't get the disorder uh, or disorders by um, just one of your parents having the condition. Uh, uh, however, they they can cause some serious difficulties, and some of you may have heard very very recently. Uh, about the young man in London who uh, was a sickle cell uh, sufferer who uh, was in hospital and literally had to phone in to, to, to get some treatment because of uh, um, the, the, the issues that have been sort of uh, made worse by coronavirus, but uh, by, by not all means because of that. Because really what has happened, there's not been sufficient investment uh, in treating these things. A little bit more though about sickle cell, because uh, I'm conscious that uh, um, time is not necessarily with me. Uh, although I'm, I know that as you haven't got all your speakers, it may be that uh, time is not quite as uh, inflexible as it might have been otherwise. So, um, so data from the sickle cell um, society would indicate that uh, uh, one in four uh, West Africans uh, actually affected by this, and one in 10 Africans generally. Um, and But it also affects the Asian community. Uh, and actually we can see some impact even within Mediterranean, Mediterranean communities. Sickle cell itself is uh, uh, considered the most uh, uh, common of all the genetic disorders that you find here. Um, I don't think people would necessarily be aware of this. Um, but of course, uh, it it does affect uh, people from Africa and the Caribbean and and India and the Mediterranean, so more so than others. Uh, so to illustrate the point I made earlier on, I think you'll see from the images here uh, how uh, the condition is uh, is um, transmitted. So you'll see that uh, um, uh, if you got uh, both parents or carriers, uh, then actually uh, there is a a 25% chance of uh, one of those children that they might have, uh, uh, of any one of those children um, having uh, the disorder, um, and a 50% chance um, that uh, uh, they are going to be carriers and only 25% that they won't be. So um, uh, 
clearly it's much more likely if you've got two partners you're going to have either someone with a condition or uh, uh, or uh, being a carrier of the condition um so thalassemia uh, like sickle cell is an inherited blood disorder so um from these images you can see the shape isn't quite the same but it's actually uh, misshaped nevertheless um and uh, there's said to be two types uh, alpha, uh, alpha and beta thalassemia um just a bit more information around about these matters so uh, it is said that there's some 3000 babies born um uh, worldwide with uh, sickle cell and uh, in the UK itself there's some 15,000 people with a condition and again in the UK we have a, uh, about 270 p uh, babies uh, born every year um, with the condition. My understanding is that in Hertfordshire the numbers aren't as uh, significant as they are in London but those numbers are increasing. Um, they, there isn't any cure for um, sickle cell disease, uh, which is the SCD, uh, apart from having uh, a bone marrow transplant. Uh, uh, but of course, um, um, there's a issue around having access to suitable donors. And uh, there is an issue there about us having people um, within our, uh, th those communities most affected, actually uh, putting themselves on the, the list uh, to, to, to become donors. Um, and as far as thalassemia is concerned, uh, that's they said to affect about three, 280 million um, uh, people across the, um, the globe. And uh, as said uh, previously, it's uh, uh, very much uh, uh, a sort of a, you might call it a, a tropical uh, condition affecting those people from um, Southern Europe, um, the, the Middle East and, and, and Africa uh, and, and Asia. So um, that's the, the, the things that we're dealing with. So as far as uh, us as an association uh, is concerned, what for the African Caribbean Association has said, the sickle cell and thalassemia support group is a part of that. This particular group has been going for over 40 years now. It came out of uh, an incident uh, back then when there was a young uh, child um, who uh, born in Watford who was diagnosed with a condition and there wasn't really any support mechanisms around at the time and the group uh, started up back there in 1980. Uh, I have to say I wasn't involved uh, then, I've been involved for quite a long time but not quite as long as that. Um, it is led by volunteers and particularly now um, we are very dependent on volunteers with the impact of finance, financial impact on the charitable sectors. Um, and we we aim to give support across the board. Um, we are members of the Sickle Cell Society and uh, we are we have been linked also to the uh, thalassemia, uh, UK thalassemia uh, uh, sort of society too. Um, our approach is uh, uh, to offer a, a really friendly, uh, unapproachable, sensitive uh, environment. Um, we, are, we are seeking to create an environment where people can share experiences. Um, the pandemic has meant that we've not been able to do very much of that uh, in recent times, but we are also looking to provide much more support um, and to provide uh, some awareness uh, around the issues. And this is really sort of a, a part of the exercise. Uh, we are looking to do a lot more work with our schools and uh, the contact details for, for our uh, group and the organization is there. Um, there are some events that we've got coming up. We've got, uh, of course, um, the 19th of June every year is World Sickle Cell Day. And um, um, we, we, we were looking to do something on the 19th of June. However, by virtue of the fact that it is uh, World Sickle Cell Day, of course, everybody's trying to do something on the same day. So we've therefore decided that we wouldn't do something on that day. So uh, you'll see there, and I'll, I can put this in, in the chat, the leaflets uh, there that we're having a Sickle Cell Awareness uh, evening on the 30th of June. Uh, it is by, by Zoom. Uh, so, um, uh, we, I'll just ask if anyone wants to, 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 to be involved, they can contact us and we will certainly um, 
uh, share the information with you and we will share the information to Michaelia so you'll be able to uh, join us if you will. Uh, so there are some links uh, that I can share to various bodies where you can get more information. Um, uh, Sickle Cell Society, for which we are members, I've said. Um, blood donation is a big issue. When people have crises, uh, blood transfusion is a, is a key part of that. And uh, um, uh, the blood do do donation link there to encourage people to do that is there. Uh, we've also got Sickle Cell Awareness. Um, there's a NHS sickle cell information site, which will give you more information about that situation. And similarly, we have the uh, Thalassemia Society, and uh, there's also NHS Thalassemia information that's there. So the, the, the body of information is increasing. Um, there is a lack of uh, research, uh, um, uh, and I used to be involved in a, a body call. Uh, the organization for sickle cell I mean anemia research which uh, in effect is now merged with sickle cell society but uh, uh, they were campaigning for a very long time to try and get uh, more research to be done in a condition and these conditions which are much more pronounced than people would imagine because you'd probably think that uh, leukemia would be um, uh, much more uh, significant, um, but it isn't a sickle cell uh, would be so. So I think I'll um, leave a questions there, but um, I, there may be other speakers, so I'll stop sharing uh, there. So that's uh, basically, uh, I presume, I think I may have used up more than 10 minutes. I'm sorry about that. Oh, thank you so much, Clive. And it's, it's fine. As you mentioned, we had two speakers uh, drop out. So that was that was great. Thank you. Um, so Amy, now it goes to the Amy. Uh, Sue and Gwal has been in the waiting room for quite a long time. Can you let her in, please? Uh, the doors for the meeting close at quarter past eight for security reasons, so that's not really possible anymore. Um, okay, so, I'll speak. I'll, yeah. I'll speak about this later. So uh, now we open to the to any questions from the speakers. Uh, so if you have any questions, please raise your hand or put them in the chat and we'll read them out. Thank you. Any questions, anyone? Live, I've got a question about um, with regards to um, <clears throat> uh, in the black community. Um, do you think there is enough awareness being put um, being made? aware of how to look after those in the black community with um, that, that um, uh, struggle with sickle cell? Um, there, is, there is not uh, still now uh, enough awareness. Uh, we do have, for example, in, in, in Artfordshire, we, we work with a, um, a sickle cell specialist nurse um, that's attached to both the list and the Watford General Hospital uh, for children. Uh, there isn't any similar resources uh, uh, for adults, and it actually is part of a conversation we wanted to have with uh, um, uh, the health authorities regarding whether uh, what can be done regarding that. Um, and, and actually, what we do have. The profile of our, our communities, uh, uh, if I uh, speak about the African origin communities, which is particularly pronounced as far as sickle cell is concerned, the profile, I think across Hartford has been increasing with uh, uh, the sort of uh, um, arrival of uh, an increasing proportion of people from Africa and quite a lot from West Africa, which uh, you'll see from the information is where it's more pronounced. So I think that there is going to be an increase in need around this. One of the issues that we've seen ourselves uh, historically is because we're located, of course, in Watford, although we, we do work across the surrounding areas. Um, we, uh, a lot of the people have historically in the past receive 
their treatment in London. So people have often gravitated towards uh, London. But as the, the population within the, the Watford and the, the, the Hertfordshire area, uh, we think that there is now time for us to look at how we can do more. But actually, that awareness is not there. So that's why we're trying to try and do a bit more, a bit more work um, in schools. And we're, we're certainly will be looking to see whether we can get more uh, people on board to can help uh, by way of volunteering to, to spread the word and raise the awareness. And part of this conversation that we have in under 30 is about that. Okay. And um, we'll be able to find out how we can better support um, those in the community and, and, and obviously um, spread the awareness as well. Um, cause it's not something that, um, cause my brother, I think is sick as cell trait. Um, and my mum told me a couple of stuff if something was to go wrong, but it was all kind of a lot of information and I didn't really understand it. So, um, so that would be a, a, a fantastic event, I think. So we will definitely, um, promote that for you. Um, uh, uh indeed, uh, I would say, uh, further though, that, uh, um, I mean, I used to myself think that actually, um, if you are, if you have the trait, in other words, you're a carrier, yeah. that you're not um, really impacted by the condition. But actually, I've learned uh, that actually, was having a trait means that you wouldn't suffer some really severe sort of uh, um, responses that you'd have as a um, somebody who's uh, um, or who actually has a full blown condition. Uh, there are still complications um, that can cause pain and, and, and discomfort uh, uh, too. Uh, but the, the, the main thing is actually uh, to recognize that uh, um, uh, when you are having relationships, uh, uh, if you're getting together with somebody who has uh, the trait too, that uh, um, there is a really good chance uh, that you are going to um, have children who would either have the traits or uh, uh, would be um, would have the condition. Right, right. Um, I've got a question for Alex, if I may, Alex. <laughs> um, with do you and say if you don't, um, do you get any um, any calls specifically from the black community um, on around crime and arrests? at all i know it's something that you don't cover um and you probably but do you get anyone calling you asking for advice or anything like that with with being arrested or, or something being done that um wasn't within the human rights of how you should be looked after looked after if is that a better word um by by the authority we, we do it, it is a, 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 a i know we've spoken about it as well whilst it's not it's not my area of expertise we, we do um and whilst you know, the police do a fantastic job. I'll be extremely careful with what I say. With David Lloyd uh, listening in, I'm sure he'll, he'll smile as I'm talking. Um, it's it's a very difficult job. Um, but uh, yes, he is smiling. That's good. That's a relief. Um, uh, <laughs> but uh, we, we we get inquiries from all all, uh, all communities about the increasing uh, scrutiny that people are under, um, if I can put it that way. Um, and I think, you know, the, the coronavirus regulations are, are particularly, um, or were particularly, sorry, um, uh, flavour of the month uh, a few months ago in terms of that. But, uh, um, we, we, we do, there is a whole raft of uh, uh, ideal, ideological fighting, I would say, about whether we need to go further in terms of uh, our policing or whether, in fact, we've gone too far. So um, it is interesting. I think um, I'm sure Dave will agree that um, uh, there are probably rights on both sides of that argument. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you how how um, how do you advise parents that come to you and say we're just we you know we're concerned about a certain situation? Um, do you just um, do you just relay them onto um, a colleague or someone you know that can deal with it better, or how does how does your firm um, handle those calls? Is it in, in particular to um, wrongful arrests? Is, yeah. is that what you're yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So um, I work closely with a firm 
um, based in North London, who deals with um, what we call actions against the police. And so absolutely, I would put them in, in contact with, with a colleague of mine uh, at that other firm. Um, but uh, yes, what worried parents are uh, free, frequent callers, um, because at the end of the day, we all, we all worry for our children, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, did anyone... Sonia, did you have a question? I thought that was Sonia then. So, so, sorry, um, Michaela. Um, yes. Denzel, Denzel had his hand up for quite oh. a while. Oh, Denzel, sorry, darling. Sorry, sorry. Oh, gosh. I'm so sorry, Denzel. <laughs> I, I would. Yeah. Uh, my name is Denzel, as you can see. Um, I am speaking from Huddersfield. I thought I'd join you um, to, see, to see how the other half lived. Uh, <laughs> it's with regards to um, sickle cell. Um, we, we, we've had a, a, a movement of sickle cell for years in Huddersfield, but it's never actually got off the ground. Um, it stops and starts and stops and, and starts. What I notice is that I have a cousin in London who gets quite a lot of um, uh, uh, services from the NHS in London, but that, that service seemed to peter out north of Watford. And uh, in Huddersfield, even though it's spoken about, there's no real service um, from the community. And certainly um, the services is not there from the National Health Service. What I think we need to do is start to raise the awareness more vigorously in the provinces as they do in London so that the uh, NHS responds. There's a lot of work to be done. Screening out, as you touched earlier, on relationships and how we can screen out um, sickle cell is one of the educational processes. The other thing is that people need to, um, to have services in their homes or services in the community. In, uh, and, and certainly in the hospital. Um, there are crises that are not dealt with proactively. They're reactive and that's too late. And I think we need to have some structures in place in the provinces where we can have oxygen, we can have nurses, we can have doctors and departments that specialize or at least give some close attention to sickle cell. It is a growing uh, problem. We only, in the last couple of days, we have a chap who, who um, had, had decided that over the years, he's going to um, talk about sickle cell and, 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 and deal with it. He just died. And I, I, I feel that the movement will die with him unless we take it up and vigorously move and put some pressure on the National Health Service uh, for action to, to be taken, especially outside London. Thank you. Can I come, come back in on uh, uh, what uh, Denzel just said there? Um, a couple of things. One, um, unfortunately, like a number of things that have impacted on, um, if I speak specifically about uh, the, uh, um, what I call uh, people from African heritage, although I know there's some other issues for other minority communities too. Um, the communities have been seriously impacted for a while by approaches that governments have taken to, to supporting organizations that have worked within communities, um, offering some of the uh, services that the mainstream has not been able to provide. Uh, so, and what is, so it's become much more difficult, whilst at the same time, there's been more demands some being made on these organizations for them to deliver. I'll say that. Um, I would say that one of the things is, the, is that they historically, 
some near 50 percent of that that population has lived in london which is one of the reasons why i think a lot of the resources have been uh, there but actually that then just shows up the idea um that where people are more dispersed it's more difficult to get the support and often they are well not often they're they're similarly in need of that support because if you are if you are a sickler then it doesn't really matter whether you're in Othersfield or London you still have the need for support when 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 it arises uh, and I think that uh, um, what I would say though um, the sickle cell society works nationally so I'd say it might be uh, Denzel if you look at the link to the sickle cell society it may be that uh, 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 John James, who is the chief exec there, might be a good person to, to for somebody in other field to contact and say, look, can you come and talk to us about how we might be able to uh, get some local initiative um, engaging with the health sector too, because it's got to be a partnership to provide that kind of support. Thank you. Uh, um, Michaela, I did want to um, uh, come touch on that ish question that you raised earlier on um, regarding the, the police. Um, I don't have any answers, but I do e equally have some questions. And I see that David is here. Um, because actually, a few months ago, I was called by the parent of a young man who was uh, only 18, uh, uh, driving his mom's car, and for no uh, evident reason, was stopped. Um, and his, his mom called me up um, to say, how can this be happening? Uh, after what's happened with George Floyd and all this kind of thing, why is a, a young man not allowed to drive a car? Um, and I think there is a, um, I've actually had a meeting with some local police officers looking at this uh, this matter down here in Watford. And uh, uh, it's interesting to note that uh, 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 apparently only one in five of the stop and the, 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 the black people were stopped uh, are seen to have committed any crime. So uh, you're kind of stopping all these people to find uh, one bad apple uh, amongst five. And I think uh, there is an issue about uh, uh, whether or not there are uh, uh, more intelligent ways in which we can do these things that's not perceived to be um, kind of uh, um, adversely impacting on a particular community. And I say this as somebody who, uh, some 40 plus years ago was being st stopped in the same way. And um, I see that this is uh, still happening and it's something that we, we need to reverse. I think David wanted to come in, Michaela. David, David yeah, uh, 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 Amy, sorry. Uh, David wants to come in. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to take that now or indeed to to leave it to later. The reason I'm here tonight is to listen, not to not to, um, uh, to to offer necessarily any solutions. And the reason I think it's important to listen is that um, uh, you know I'm my role as an elected person is to represent every community in holding the constabulary to account, and also to um, reflect difficult though that is because we haven't got a homogenous community um you know it's a heterogeneous um uh, community um but to reflect what all people want in what i do and before i come back specifically to clive's comments let me let me give you a sort of uh, context of where i'm coming from i mean the there is something of disproportionality in policing. There is no doubt whatsoever about that. I think the term disproportionality is a neutral term, but I recognize it exists. And I think that in my, my first thoughts around it, and I'm not going to uh, respond too quickly, I want to respond in a way which is measured and appropriate rather than just a sort of gut reaction. But my first thoughts are that, for example, and I note that 
Um, uh, we're not using acronyms, and I think that's really very, very positive. And I think perhaps in some ways you're underlining that acronyms, for example, like BAME, almost um, underline the problem out there rather than actually um, solving, because actually um, it is unhelpful to um, to think that every single um, part of um, the Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities are exactly the same, any more than all parts of the United Kingdom are exactly the same. Um, we've all got sort of very different um, parts, even up to Huddersfield, Denzel, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's dif different in all parts of the land and in the community. And I think that actually it's quite helpful for us to recognize that when we, we talk about it. And I think that language is really important. And I often get it wrong, but I think language is important because people feel valued or not valued by the language that we use and the approach that we take. I'm really concerned about disproportionality but let me say, first of all, I'm really concerned that the likelihood that, that in many ways we have not um, made sufficient of the fact that the likelihood of being murdered on the streets of London and the likelihood of being murdered on the streets in Hertfordshire is is really low, thankfully. It's a really safe county. But if we just go into London, I, I still have seared on my memory that front page of the Evening Standard, which showed the first 100 people to die on the streets of London. That page was full of photographs of black faces. I think the real outrage is the disproportionality in deaths on the street of young black males. And we've got to do something about it. And part of what we've got to do, most of those young black males were killed by young black males. We need to do something about that. And part of the response is stop and search. But I don't think we've explained it sufficiently to the community. And communication is really important because people carrying knives, the most likely outcome of carrying a knife is that you, as the knife carrier, will die. Perhaps not the most likely outcome, but actually a lot of people will die because they're carrying a knife themselves. And we've got to recognise and we've got to work out when the police are proportionately stopping and searching against the fact, and that's where I come back to Clive, that it is an outrage that I've never been stopped driving a car, but you have. For reason, because you're white, David. I, 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 that's what the point I'm making. You don't need to make it for me. That's the point I'm making. It's an outrage that I haven't been stopped. And the difference between me and Clive we're both middle-class males. The difference is, Clive, you are a black male and I am a white male. And I recognize that there may be all sorts of reasons that you were stopped, Clive, which I have no understanding of, but I just find it curious that I've never been stopped. And so uh, we do oh, need to sorry, get... No, so to, um, continue, David, please, yes. We do need to find the confidence in the system that the reason that Clive was stopped was not because of his race. And there may be, you know, it may have been an evening on which someone had been murdered and that the, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, suspect was a black male. It could have been that. But I very much doubt it was because of that. And so we do need to get underneath that so that the public understand, all parts of the public understand that there is 
um, an issue there and actually say, yes, we fully respect why people are being stopped and searched. And I think that it's really unhelpful that it has now become seen as um, an act of disproportionate, I suppose it is seen by some communities as racism, rather than something which is being used positively to ensure that people are safe on the streets. And I think that's the, that's the difficulty we've got. But as I say, I'm here to listen, not to preach, and I really am not looking to preach around it. But I think that if we can somehow get all communities to have, um, to, to have confidence in their local police, that is our starting point. And I think we move on from there around how do we, um, how do we ensure that we have a police force that reflects its community. And actually, I don't mean by that ensuring that we find out what um, the proportion of Albanians is in the community and ensure that we have that number or as a proportion of Albanians in our police force, nor to that matter how many people of a Welsh heritage such as mine are in the police force and ensure we have that number, nor indeed those from a, a Caribbean heritage or a, an African heritage. But what I think is important is that we find out why people of different heritage, or sorry, first of all, find out whether people of different heritages have confidence in policing and find out why people of different heritage are not um, applying to be police officers. Because actually some people will not apply because they don't actually rate it as a career and don't feel it's something they want to do. But if people are not applying because they don't have confidence that the police force treats them um, proportionately, then we've got a problem and we've got to change that part of it more so than just having uh, numbers X, Y or Z as a percentage within our policing. And we also need um, just to, you know, I, I was once told by a gay, uh, a gay female police officer how difficult it was for people who were gay to report crimes on the basis that they felt that they would have to disclose their sexuality, especially if perhaps it had been a, a domestic uh, assault or whatever, they would have to disclose their, um, their sexuality. And actually the same isn't true in terms of having to disclose if someone is from a vis visible ethnic minority. But it is about, will the police understand the issue that I have? And until the, uh, all communities within Hertfordshire believe that they will be listened to, we're going to have a problem there. And that's why I want to hear from you and we'll be hearing more and more from people advising me. That's why I want to hear what your thoughts are around how we get that confidence in policing. And that doesn't mean necessarily that I will agree with what you've said, but I will listen to what you say. Right, we have a lot of hands up. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> There's hands of everywhere. Um, uh, I, I, I think we'll go back to Clive. If, is, is that um, um, Amy? I'll let you chair. Sorry. Um, yeah. No, it's fine. Um, yeah, I'd say we've got a lot of questions, a lot of things to say. So I'm going to go straight to Clive. Yeah. Clive, Clive, you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry. A few things that I, uh, I would say. Um, David, you're, you're, you're seeking feedback, and uh, so I will feedback uh, some things uh, uh, to you. Uh, just touching on the issue of BAME, it's a red herring. Um, we've placed far too much focus on what is not the issue. There is a, there's a place for 
a notion of something like being uh, black Asian or minor ethnic. Uh, it kind of is around looking at some people who have some some things in common around their experience of racism. And despite the civil report, there is still racism around. And actually it impacts on Africans and Asians and, 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 and others. So there is a there's a role for that in that context. But actually, if all you're saying is you're calling people BAME and you're not looking uh, beneath uh, the, at the micro level at what's happening to West Africans, uh, what's happening to uh, um, uh, Black women, uh, what's happening to Asian women, uh, then you're missing the point. And actually, the civil report got that completely wrong. I do some work for the NHS, and as long as I can remember, they've always looked at What's happening? What's the experience of uh, Pakistanis and what's the experience of Bangladeshis? So uh, the, the, the term BAME uh, is used a, as a bit of an umbrella and it doesn't mean that uh, you don't look beneath at the cover. So we, we, we get distracted by uh, actually focusing on what isn't important. You know, um, if we stop looking at the issues that concerns, like for example, I was talking about sickle cell and looking at that issue and looking at how we deal with it, then actually we're missing the point and we're getting distracted. Uh, so um, I just wanted to also touch on this issue of black and black crime though, because actually as somebody who came here in the seventies, I'm sort of part of this so-called Windrush generation. Um, what I saw happening then, and actually we're seeing the legacy of this. I'm not even gonna go back 400 years that we could do, uh, but uh, the, Situation that I saw uh, when I came here was a situation of serious discrimination in the education system against, um, I'm going to say, African and Caribbean uh, young people. So much so that some of those young people say, saw little other options other than to engage in criminal activities. I don't condone that activity, but actually I think we have to understand the context within which certain things have taken place. Uh, because um, they have actually been discriminated against uh, in every sphere of uh, the, the society that you can find, and it's still happening now. Now, what we've seen, and we don't have to look at race in the context of this, if you look at some of these uh, working class uh, uh, areas uh, um, in, uh, uh, say, up in uh, Scotland and uh, north of England, what you see is not black and black violence, but you see working class uh, white kids actually being violent uh, to each other. And what, so what we're seeing there is the impact of an unfair society, which creates a situation where people feel that uh, um, they are, uh, as it were, powerless uh, to do anything uh, uh, as far as the system is concerned. So people uh, turn, turn inwards, Again, it's not the right uh, solution, it's not the way how we do it, but actually we have to understand the frustration and the difficulties that people are facing. So it's, uh, so, so sort of stop and search. If that's the solution, it isn't the solution. Uh, what we have to think about is look at this in, 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 in overall. What are strategies that we're gonna put in place that will begin to sort of create uh, let's call it a leveling up. Um, we've been hearing that term being used around um, the north, north south divide. And, and when you start looking at this in a holistic way, you will create a situation where you can find long term solutions, which will mean that we don't have these violent situations happening uh, in uh, uh, poor neighborhoods, uh, uh, whether they're black or, or white. And we're not, we tend to take a sort of a, a tunnel vision. Let's look at the policing element of this. We, we have to look at this as a, at a much broader social uh, situation. And um, my final point is, uh, um, David, around proportionality. I agree with you, proportionality is, is right. I also agree with you that actually having black faces isn't necessarily the solution to, to, to the problem. Because when you have a society that is uh, uh, um, institutionally um, uh, racist, despite what uh, um, the civil reporter said, then actually put in um, a, a black face um, in that situation isn't the solution to that problem, that the structure is still wrong. Um, so what we have to look at is how are we going to change all of those structures so that we all have equal life chances and you get a, uh, you, you, uh, you get a just outcome because uh, 
I also agree with you that uh, uh, saying that um, uh, you're going to have, uh, uh, because we are 10% of the population, we should have 10% of the jobs and so on. It's just not practically. It's not, not going to work practically. But we do have to think in terms of proportionality, but we have to think about how do we get there? You know, and we what are the strategies? And it's not just the policing strategies, it's across the board where we're looking at some of the social ills that have uh, that are still infecting our society uh, now. And I think once we get that commitment and the work to do that, I think these are the problems will be resolved more easily. I think I've said too much. Thank you, Clive. Um, I just have a contribution. So can I give that, Michaelia? Uh, yes, and then we'll have Val. Sorry, Val, you've been waiting so lovely. Um, yes, Amy and then Val. Yeah. Thank you. So I just um, was listening to some stuff. So I'm just going to pick up on that. So um, Alex, earlier on, he you said about the the police doing a good job. And I think the point is, is that they're really not doing a good job for a lot of communities, specifically the black community. And that leads into what I'm going to say to David. Um, so you did, as Clive picked up or mentioned about what's termed black on black crime, which is a myth because I think all, um, I think it has been actually reported that every race is more likely to kill someone of their own race and white people do commit a higher rate of crime than black people. Um, and there's also, there's a lot of talk about you know black teenagers stabbing black teenagers, but there's no talk about the amount of white teenagers, white teenage boys that are falling into right-wing extremism. And that's been rising for quite a long time. And as Clive also said, sorry to piggyback off you, Clive, these there are long-term solutions that we know work better. Like, you know, a lot of youth work and and I think even youth clubs and stuff like that have been linked to preventing crime in communities all communities not just the black community because they are not the problem stop and search it is a racist tactic and i think if there is if there is no ability to admit that then i think that you know coming here to listen isn't going to isn't going to work you know in terms of because stop and search does not prevent crime there are statistics, there's data everywhere. It does not prevent crime. And it's disproportionately having some, there are some really traumatizing stories of stop and search if you really listen in on them. And I just think if we can't move past the point of admitting that stop and search is a racist tactic that isn't effective, then not much productive change is really gonna happen. So that's um, my point. I don't know if anyone wants to respond or we just go straight over to to Val's points. Uh, let's go to Val because she's been waiting so lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, while I was waiting, David, I was looking at your webpage, uh, which is actually very interesting, on heartscommissioner.org uh, about your thoughts on your role. And I was particularly interested in there's a, a, a table which compares the, the difference between the police and crime commissioner and the chief constable. And it makes quite clear that in your job as police and crime commissioner, you are there to actually make the decisions and the chief constable is there basically to make sure they're carried out. And one that particularly that's mentioned on that page I'd like to talk about is the present five year police and crime plan. Could you give us an um, some instances of that, some items on it, which are going to, to help the situation we've been talking about stop and search tonight in Hertfordshire. David, did you want to come, come back to Val's uh, contribution? I was waiting. Um, there's always a danger in these sorts of meetings that uh, they sort of, um, you know, I know Val's a, uh, a valued Labour councillor in, um, <laughs> in North Hearts, and they actually start to become more about um, <laughs> politics than about trying to solve the problem. 
And um, uh, I think that uh, whilst I'm not going to, to, to rise to that, I think there is always that danger. And I've come here, as I say, to listen. Yeah. Um, my, my police and crime plan talks very clearly about how we, um, the, my, my role is to listen to what the public want to do. And in some ways, the role of a police and crime commissioner is not as partisan as that of a councillor, because um, you know I don't have to, in the same way, take my um, thoughts through a, a council. I don't have to find a coalition of willing people to support what I'm going to do. I listen to the public and then I make decisions. Um, in some ways, Val, I think you misrepresent and I'm sure you didn't mean to, but you misrepresent what a police and crime commissioner does. So the, um, the police and crime commissioner sets the police and crime plan, sets the budget to enable that plan to be enacted, um, appoints the chief constable or dismisses if, uh, if necessary, and holds the chief constable to account in the way that the um, plan is to being delivered, and how the budget is being um, delivered. And also, of course, has a role in uh, listening to the public and perhaps most crucially of all, ensuring that we hold the ring in terms of the whole criminal justice system. I uh, specifically came here this evening because I'm interested in people's thoughts which are not going to be from necessarily from my political heritage, nor indeed from my, um, my ethnic heritage. Um, and so it's particularly helpful to hear what people have had to say. I don't agree with everything. Um, I think, Amy, you, unfortunately, I, I, I disagree with the evidence that you bring up around um, uh, because um, it, the, the evidence around knife crime and black youth is very, very high. And we have a problem about, not in Hertfordshire, because there are very, very few, um, uh, very few uh, murders which happen. But disproportionately, if you look at those people who have been murdered and who have murdered them, they are from a black heritage. Now that's something that I want to do something about. What I accept, and I entirely accept from Clive, is that, uh, so, so I, I don't accept that it is a, in inverted commas, racist policy, but what I do accept is that we haven't, um, we haven't made the case well enough, and that people haven't um, accepted it, and until people have heard the case and have been able to um, recognize that there is some validity in what happens, or indeed, and that's what I hope that I would hear, people saying, yes, it's not stop and search, but we need to do this, because I am amazed if people around this table tonight do not believe there is a problem that disproportionately, if a white person and a black person go out on the street tonight there is a higher likelihood of under 25s there is a higher likelihood of that black person not coming home than the white person that cannot that cannot be right and we need to do something about it that's the bit that i'm pleading and you know if it's racist to try and do something about it that is racism which is acceptable because we can't have mothers losing sons to knife crime. And no so racism is, is acceptable. No racism is acceptable. Sorry, David. I, I, I think you, you misunderstand my use of the term. The, the disproportionality of um, uh, trying to ensure that people do not die of knife crime is in itself something which is worth doing. 
However, I recognize that, um, that that is a really difficult message to sell because, and you know, everyone who's spoken this evening has spoken about um, disproportionality. And that is something which means that the validity of the police is undermined because some communities will feel that they are not, that they feel that the outcome that the police want isn't the outcome that I can assure you they do want. And I think that is a, a really difficult thing to do. And that's what we've got to try and find some way of bridging. Um, you know, it's not Val about us trying to sort of make petty political points. It's about trying to work together to ensure that people, no matter what their race, are safe on the streets of Hertfordshire. And that's my disappointment that you're sort of trying to make a case about, oh, well, you know, I've been looking at this and that's, that, that, that's uh, you know, you're, you're not doing sufficient. Um, I, I'm trying to do sufficient. And I really think that, you know, I have an opportunity in the role I've got to work on a non-partisan basis with people of all political backgrounds and of none and across each community to make sure that we do have uh, a real uh, acceptance that what we are trying to do is positive. And that actually where um, there is, and that's where I, I don't know who said no racism is uh, acceptable, that is where um, I would, um, uh, accept that where something is seen as racist rather than trying to save lives, we've got to call it out and we've got to ensure that the communities don't feel that that's what's happening. May I reply? Uh, yes, yes, Val, please. Yep. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, David. Um, it may be worth you knowing that actually I'm a regular member of this group and a regular contributor. I'm also one of your residents. And what I did was to actually read your page. And I asked for just one thing in your police plan, five year plan, which is going to help to resolve or better this situation. Just one action, one plan. Could you give that to us, please? And I'm not being political at all. Treat yes, me out like a resident. Yeah. Yeah, yes, you are. You're, you're trying to make petty points, and I'm trying to work alongside you. And you're the not trying. Here? Please, some um, time, plan. Be petty. David, I, behave. Uh, Stop that I, now. Stop that. Sorry, sorry um, David. You're completely in your position to, um, to, to, to not answer or answer any questions. So please feel comfortable. And um, Val, you're also in completely in your position to, um, to relay any question that you that you wish within obviously respect and no swearing, etc. Um, but uh, uh, I just have to remind you, you lovely both contributors, and thank you so much for your for this for this well, that's happening now. I know it's uncomfortable because um, it is an uncomfortable subject, but I, I'm so grateful for all of you for being brave and contributing your thoughts. Um, but just if I could just remind you of um, just to um, I know it's very hard when you when you wear different hats, but just to uh, uh, gear your questioning so it isn't um, as political. Would it be if could I ask if if I, which it wasn't? I'm not alluding that it was. I'm not alluding that it was Val. I'm not. I'm definitely I'm not um, completely understand what you said. Um, uh, David, would 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 it um, would I be able to I'm, I'm not a. Um, political person at all um would could could I ask that question and you're completely in your position not to answer I you know and I wouldn't hold it against you but could I could I ask you um is within your plan you've obviously seen and I think correct me if I'm completely wrong that um within um within uh, the disproportionate arrests on that subject there is there is something to be done there something needs to be done um uh, is there something you could share with us tonight um uh, that uh, your plan one piece of a plan to to tackle that to that situation at all so um I mean, first first of all let me give you a context because um as i'm as as you may not know um, there is a um, 
there is a, a, a legal duty after every single election to um, write within one year a police and crime plan. I call it a community safety and criminal justice plan in Hertfordshire. Um, I've had a number of them since I was first of all elected in 2012. Um, the, um, probably the, the area that is the most um, uh, likely to answer your question is that the heart of my plan is putting victims at the heart of everything we do. And um, I'm really particularly proud of uh, something called the Beacon Hub, which is there to support victims in their journey. And, you know, that's something that Alex will know about. That's something that, um, you know, many people around the table will know about. And I think that that is the bit which gives the voiceless their greatest voice. And if there is anyone who feels that um, they have been um, unjustly um, uh, uh, involved with the police, we've also got, and within the plan you'll see that I was one of those who has gone to the maximum level of having a, uh, a, a complaints procedure, which really takes very seriously what people who um, have uh, an issue with policing, um, what what uh, what what uh, what that issue is, and looks into it. And in many ways, it's that that which reflects my um, my. Uh, support of the public and my reflection of what the public what the public do and that of course then leads on to the police and crime plan so um, that's the way that you get involved I also intend and will be um, establishing a, a sounding board of um, of of uh, there, I'll probably have two or three different sounding boards, but one of the most important things I've said to my own team has been around diversity. We've got to get underneath it. Now, I might not um, have the same solutions that you might want me to have. Um, and, you know, I recognise that we all might find different ways of solving um, an issue which I have heard more and more about. But um, what... Um, is important is that I, I hear what people are saying so that that next plan can be, um, can be done. I also um, have established, and was one of the first in the country, to establish an independent stop and search scrutiny panel chaired by a former judge um, and uh, with uh, a wide range of um, uh, um, people from uh, uh, black and uh, Asian communities uh, who, who sit on it. Um, which, that... members, which members of that scrutiny panel are black? Because the leaders, I'm aware of all black leaders in Hertfordshire. Um, Clive, um, I haven't got in front of me oh, the. Okay. Right. I, haven't got, I haven't got in front of me the full, but sure. I can assure you there are black members on it. Okay, thank you, David. All right. Yeah. Um, but um, the um, uh, the uh, the what that does is to take um, body worn video evidence. Every single stop and search um, is liable to be looked at. Not everyone will be, but every single stop and search is looked at. They will look at it for disproportionality and to see whether or not there was justification in that stop and search. And what they have found, and you may well have heard because it comes to my police and crime panel, you may well have heard that we are disproportionate in terms of ethnicity of stop and search, but that actually the stop and search panel has not found that there is, um, that the stop and searches themselves are unjustifiable. And they will look through it and they work through each area. And every um, time they meet, they have two chief inspectors from two different districts 
who will come and explain what has happened. That is independent and is really important that it happens. And they produce, and you may well have seen, an annual report. And that annual report um, talks about how many stops there have been, what the disproportionality is, whether they have any concerns. So I think, although I did brush off Val earlier, I think that you're, you're here, that there's plenty that we're doing um, and that there will be more. Okay, um, David, I just, um, just to pick up on a few things, um, just come back on you. Um, you mentioned a lot of things from your perspective that you're doing, which sounds, it sounds from your perspective, very intelligent things, very thought about things from your perspective. Um, but I often worry um, uh, with, with those within your position that are in the position of power to implement change. Um, are not um, implementing or, or cultivating um, the voices that um, that a necessity for the actual outcome that you require. So um, you mentioned that you were or are, I should say, you are an elected um, official. I suppose that's the correct term. Um, and you listen to the public, the said public, and implement what you need to implement. Um, I get that. Um, that's necessity what democracy is, and that's great. But I just wonder, because um, the people that majority that you're listening to, uh, I'm going to guess without seeing everyone that you've listened to, are majority um, not only white, but of the average white lived experience that may be contributing to their contributing uh, contribution to you. So um, from your, um, from your, um, from those within that work with you, from officials like yourself, because it's not just you. Um, I know, I know you get it quite a bit. Um, I've been watching a lot of the stuff. I know you get it quite a bit, um, and I understand that your position you're in. I would just like to contribute that when you come to listening to um, to all the different opinions from all the different communities, or specifically what we're talking about to here, the black community that it might be an idea to, um, to cultivate the, those voices from directly from our leaders, from the leaders that are on the ground, like Clive, like myself, and I'm sure others, who are, who are with the, the people who he was actually affecting. Because I know you said, you mentioned that there are black people on that panel. Okay, great. Um, but the transparency with the connection between those groups and panels that are created and the black community seems to be um, very thin. So um, it would be great if those in the community like myself, I'm a mother of a son and other mothers, their, their mothers, their white mothers that are, um, you know, mothers to son who were considered black, but obviously are dual heritage, um, would like to see where, where those, who those people are. You know, we want to see, uh, um, and if you're saying that they're really not seeing that there is a problem where um, where we're seeing on the ground that they are, there seems to be some sort of disconnect in the communication. And I just wondered if that if that disconnect is coming from um, uh, the just not the cultivating from the actual community itself. I think what's happening is because again you've already touched on it there are there there's reasons why uh the black community doesn't engage with um with authority um not just with authority with with councils as well you know i've i've recently been in a conversation with um with councillors that you know are trying to engage the black community and it's very difficult um and there are there are a lot of hard things to hear um, sometimes along that and I, I understand that that's a journey but I, I would just like to just put to you that I, I think one of your approaches will be just cultivating from the actual leaders that are that are representing our communities. Clive shared a story today with a mother coming to him. Stories like that our leaders can share with those in in position like yourself that has the power of change 
for you to consider um, to hear those stories that that might help your aims. I don't know what you think about that, but I just wanted to contribute that to you. I mean, I, I, it's, a, it's a helpful thought. Um, the difficulty that all elected people have is um, who they represent and who they listen to. No matter who we are, that's always difficult. Um, the real difficulty I have with any community group is it's the Tony Benn issue, you know, um, who elects you? How did you get your power? How do we get rid of you? Um, and in many ways, you know, Tony Benn was quite right. Um, it is always really difficult with community groups to find out who they represent, what they represent, um, and what authority they have. And so therefore, in many ways for me, it is better to try and have as many wide conversations as possible than to say this organization represents because to an extent that's the point you're making but the other way around you know there is a danger that we say that this organization whatever it is yeah. um it's the organization which represents all black people or all white people or all people um and i, of course I definitely, that, sorry just to come back on that i think that's a really healthy thought I think that why it's for me it's healthy is because it it allows accountability because I believe what you've just said should also be applied to yourself and those in position who elected you where did you get your power from etc 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 yeah um, the difficulty is our leaders um, have been brought up from the situation they're in these are the leaders we have we have Clive, we have myself. These, we, we don't have the resources that is available to the average white male and average white female. Just acquiring, we, Black Boys Letchworth have had, have had no funding and we've had people blocking our funding left, right and centre. But we're still pushing on. We've had to have this healthy and wonderful conversation we're having here today. Um, I think what, I think, I think, David, I, I understand your position. I completely understand it. But if I could put anything to you, I know you have reservations about leaders with community groups, etc. And they're completely healthy. I have them about politicians. So it's completely fine. Um, I, I would really, really like it if you would really engage with our leaders like Clive. He's been around and Clive hasn't spoken to me about this. And I'm not I haven't spoken to him about this at all. You know, this is just me as a mum talking. I, in Hertfordshire, we don't have many of them that understand the lived experiences of mums, fathers, our young ones. And these are, this is who we have. Now this may not be, um, like you said, the, um, Clive doesn't represent all black people. So you have to speak to as many as you can. But we do have some leaders that will give you an idea because you can't get the whole populate black population into your office and that would be just problematic for yourself but within the process of you cultivating of hearing the voices of Hertfordshire of what do I do really do consider people like Clive because he's very intelligent I don't have to say all this but he's very intelligent <laughs> he's he's he knows his stuff he's been around for a long time and he's very wise and his words carries a lot of weight in the black community and generational as well. Not just in my mum's generation, but also in my generation. People know him by his work, by his deeds. They don't know him as Clive Saunders OBE. I, I, have, I have inquired through the grapevine. So I, I would really, I would really, I would really, I would really love it if you would consider it and, and leave that there, sorry. <laughs> David. Right, and, and, right, I mean, you know, the, um, uh, I'm sure I don't need to say to you, the fact that I'm here this evening hopefully underlines it, my door is always open. Um, you know, that doesn't mean to say that I will be, uh, like Val, uh, uh, a regular contributor here. I think you've suggested value here every, every month. I, I won't be here every month and I won't be at 
Little Gadsden Parish Council every month either. So, you know, there is a whole range of things to do. If people are willing to help me and to support, I'd be very, very pleased um, to hear, um, you know, and at the end of the day, remember, my role is to set the policy. It isn't to set the, um, it, it, it isn't to get involved in operational policing. So, you know, I'm not going to be able to say you will or won't do that, but I can hold to account around it. And, you know, there are, we have a wide range of talent in Hertfordshire, um, but it's trying to hear, I suppose, the difficulty for you and for me is how we hear those quiet voices, how we hear those people who have um, uh, something which we need to hear, who perhaps aren't um, as well able to express it. And, you know, sometimes the way to hear those quiet voices is through organisations such as this and is through people such as Clive. So, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I, I recognise that. But there will be lots of other people as well who I, I hope will be willing to help. Yes, yes, but yes, I, I, I do definitely agree with that. Um, Clive, you wanted to come in, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just... I... Um, uh, David, um, I wasn't, uh, I certainly, when I came uh, onto this uh, platform, I didn't see this being a, a question and answer session for you, but I do have a, um, a question that, uh, uh, it would be interesting to have your take on it, uh, though, which is, uh, um, I have to tell you that um, I'm one of those people, one of the many people um, who has been annoyed by the Sewell report. And uh, I noticed that the, uh, the equalities minister uh, couldn't find anyone that, wasn't, that was happy with the Sewell report. Uh, have you had a look at it? And if so, have you got any thoughts on it? Um, I have uh, read the headlines on it. I haven't read it all. Um, uh, I thought that the headlines were interesting and I was um, willing to accept what was said. Um, I, um, the headline, of course, was that, there, that uh, broadly the United Kingdom is not a racist um, country per se, but that there is um, racism within um, the, the United Kingdom. I'm willing to believe that. But I also recognise that that, that um, uh, gives um, a lot of, um, uh, still a lot of work to do. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I am not annoyed by the report, as you claim to be. Um, uh, I think that uh, we have heard from someone who um, is... Um, uh, qualified to, to speak. And I recognize that in the same way as tonight, there will be a range of views around exactly the same issue. And by the way, that range of views doesn't mean any one of us is wrong or right. It is just our different perspective. But I see that perspective. I suppose what I take from it though is, how do we find leaders? I mean, what I take from it is, I, I genuinely believe that probably um, the United Kingdom is one of the best places to live in the world. You know, that's a sort of starting point I have. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean to say that we can't improve it and that everyone who lives in the United Kingdom has um, uh, a duty to be part of that improvement and has a duty um, to um, hear why others don't think it's um, uh, the, you know, where it could be. Um, and I recognize that if we were all of us to give up 10% of what we have, and we were all at 90% of perfect, that would be far, far better than um, people who are far from being perfect, having to live in that place so that those who are at 100% perfection uh, can continue there. So, you know, I, I recognize there's some, some work to do. 
but broadly, and I you clearly have read every single page of it, I haven't. Um, if you've read every single page of it, you may have, a, a, and a, if we both have read every single page of it, we might both have come away with a different view about it. And I'm perfectly content to um, accept that you might not, um, you might be annoyed by it, but that it might still speak to a truth uh, David, thanks very much for that. What I would say uh, about this, though, is that uh, uh, if you imagine that you want to get somewhere, and if you say, um, I'm, in, I'm in Luton, and I want to, to get to uh, Hatfield, for example, which is, uh, uh, I know, county headquarters, um then you would plan a route from um Luton to Hatfield, would you not? Yes, the answer is yes. You wouldn't plan a route that starts in Watford when in fact you're in Luton. In other words, what you have to do when you're looking at a situation like this, you have to think about where you actually are. If you get the wrong starting point, how can you end up at the wrong, how can you end up at the right destination? I just don't see how you can say um, you're going uh, from uh, Luton um, to, um, for, to, to Hatfield, but actually my starting point is actually going to be um, in, um, in Watford, and I'm actually not even going to go into Luton because I'm not. Uh, so my, my point is that uh, we have to understand what the current reality is. And actually what the report has got wrong is the current reality. We all want to end up in a particular place, but if we, if we don't identify where we're starting from, then actually how do we know that we're gonna to get to the right uh, destination when we don't even know where we're coming from? And I think this is where I think largely the report, uh, for whatever reason, uh, has seemed to have got certain things wrong. Uh, it's not the first thing that's gone wrong in this, this case. I suspect we may not agree on this either, but uh, something that's a bit of a hobby horse for me has been, the idea of um, community cohesion, which I think is linked back to this uh, old debate that we've got, where in fact, what has happened, people were sidelined into uh, specific communities as a result of the racism that they faced in the 50s and 60s. And subsequently, those same people were said to be living in parallel lives, um, which under the Blair government, uh, that's what happened to people. It's been continued with other governments. You know, so what we have to begin to do is to begin to get a, a honest analysis of our situation and don't pretend that things are um, where we think that they should be and that's where we're starting from. Ac let's accept that there are difficulties. Yes, things are not blatant uh, as it was in the, the 70s when I came here and I saw, I see a bunch of white guys coming on the road. I'd be I'd going over the other side of the road. You know, that would have been a situation where there's blatant in your face racism. The fact that that isn't there no longer. Uh, some see people are then under the misapprehension or misunderstanding that that means that racism has disappeared. That isn't, uh, uh, th there isn't a, a correlation necessarily between those things. And uh, I think, um, um, as I say, I've read, um, 90% of the uh, the uh, the civil report, and uh, uh, it it appears that um, it it there was a purpose behind this, which um, I'm not sure what the purpose was because there's certain things that just didn't correlate. For example, uh, one of the things that the report uh, identifies is that there should be um, there should be uh, ethnic data collection. Um, in relation to uh, the, the ethnic, ethnicity of the pay gap. Uh, however, rather than going on to actually recommend that this should become a mandatory requirement, it says that people should consider it. Even Theresa May, the former prime minister, could not understand how you, you sort of uh, identify this issue and there's a blatant solution in front of you and you don't actually spell it out. You know, so um, uh, I'm afraid uh, the the report is a real disappointment, and uh, um, I would I, I ask my question because I'm hoping that you will look at something like that seriously and actually not uh, follow 
that kind of misguided direction I think is seeking to lead people in. Um, Clive, um, could I just let Innie in as we've got just a few minutes? Um, and Innie, she's been waiting so lovely, uh, or, or he, I don't know if it's a, apologize if I've got um, that incorrect. Um, Innie, are you there? I am. Please. I am. And it was just to follow up on um, David's talk. Um, I was going to, well, the first thing was um, with regards to this year report, um, and you said that you read the headlines, which I suppose is fair enough for um, um, Joe Bloggs on the street. But as an elected representative of a constituency, with um, a high proportion of people of color within it, I'd have imagined that you would read more than the headlines so that you could have a more informed um, view and be able to give a more informed um, deliberation on it. Um, I have my concerns about you saying that well, you read the headlines and you took it at face value um, because I don't think that's quite good enough. And that might just be me, but I just feel that elected representatives have a certain responsibility to the constituents to actually um, do a little bit of um, diving deeper into issues. And that, you know, the SEAL report is a big thing that has um, and will have and could have a major impact on the lives of people of color in this country for a very long time. I'd have imagined that um, you would have um, read a bit more and um, anticipated that you would be asked about it and be able to give us, I'm not saying necessarily agree with it or disagree with it, but have, you know, a more balanced opinion of it, an informed opinion of it. Um, the other thing is about um, representation about, of, of um, black people and not necessarily black leaders because everybody's a leader. Everybody can be a leader if they're given, if they're afforded the opportunity. Um, uh, I just wondered how much, um, outward um, engagement work is being done to, to attract and facilitate um, the uh, involvement of, of other people of color um, to, for instance, the scrutiny panel you were talking about with regards to stop and search. How was that recruited? Where did, you know, how did you find these people? How much more, um, how much outreach has been done to encourage um, representation? I, 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 I mean, this is my, I think my second meeting I've attended and I'm quite enthused about coming to, to several more because I enjoyed, I think that the, um, the issues being discussed are very um, pertinent and uh, very discussed very intelligently. I know a couple of people here and I just wondered from your perspective, particularly looking at policing and, um, and the issues around um, young people being, you know, being faced with the trauma of, of any kind of negative engagement with the police. Now, I come from mental health background and so I'm very concerned about that. I just wondered what, you know, what you were doing from your from your office, so to speak, in terms of outreach and engagement to um, attract representation and attract um, um, a black voice. Did you want to come back on that, David? Um, uh, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah. I, I'm. I'm. I suppose I'm trying to reflect that I I joined this meeting to listen. Yes. And um, I seem to have become the sort of focus of attention without even being 
um, um, afforded the sort of uh, the, the benefit, if you like, of um, perhaps people saying at the outset, this is what I particularly want you to talk about. And I, I've tried not to. So I'm trying to, if you like, um, to, to keep on that tightrope um, whilst being fair to everyone and to be able to respond uh, as I want. Um, I... Uh, I, I'm slightly disappointed, Any, that my um, my uh, very honest and direct response about whether or not um, I have read um, all of the report, and perhaps everyone else in this group has, um, but my direct response then is criticised because I say, no, I haven't read every page of it, but I have read the highlights. There are many things that I haven't read, I'm afraid. That perhaps makes me um, not um, uh, uh, a perfect human, but it probably qualifies me for being very human. Um, and I recognize that if I had come specifically this evening to talk about it, that I would um, have had to have been better briefed on it than I am. Um, you may well have read it all, any I don't know, um, but in some ways, of course, the benefit of not having read it is that I can hear what other people think about it before I take some time to read it. So um, please don't judge my, um, my uh, passion to ensure that we are um, both uh, representative and um, uh, ensure that all people have policing in Hertfordshire, which is fair, uh, please don't judge that on whether or not I have read a report, which if I were to um, listen to Clive, um, uh, I think he would say is not really worth spending a great deal of time reading in the first place. Um, so, you know, it, it is um, uh, something which, uh, you know, we, we need to, to, to reflect on. Um, in terms of how I reach out, I think tonight is an example of me trying to reach out. Tonight is an example of listening to what people say. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't personally uh, uh, try to appoint people onto the stop and search panel. We had a process which was open, a process which specifically tried to find people who were younger, people who came from underrepresented communities within the uh, panel, and specifically um, uh, people from uh, Black heritage um, on the basis that uh, uh, yeah. disproportionality is um, a, 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 an issue. Um, and uh, whilst I know um, the chair, who is a um, former um, uh, local judge, um, uh, you know, the, um, and, and it, it is a panel which is um, entirely independent, and I think that is part of its strength, because it can then uh, report back in a, in a completely independent way uh, to me and through me to the police and crime panel. Um, ways that I can better be held to account, you know, we need to ask our councils to make sure that um, there is greater diversity than we currently have, although we have some diversity within the police and crime panel. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, two people currently, uh, I might have changed after the elections, um, certainly prior to the elections there were two people of colour who um, were uh, members of uh, the um, uh, police and crime panel, um, which is probably more diverse than most um, council uh, panels uh, that we see proportionately. Um, but, you know, it is by those people who hold to me to account having different histories that we get better outcomes. Uh, thank you. I'm just going to jump in because it is the end of the meeting. Um, thank you to everyone who attended and contributed today and a special thank you to our two speakers. Black Voice Lecture is committed to action. So if you have been delegated any actions today, please follow through. The meetings and recording and the minutes, sorry, and the recording of this meeting will be sent to you provided that we have your email. We look forward to seeing you at the next meeting and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. Amy. Amy thank you, David. Can I, um, can I uh, ask Alex, um, and thank you, David, Val, everybody, 
um, uh, Ini, everyone for your contributions. I think that's a really healthy conversation. I know, I know um, a lot of people left the meeting due to, I'm sure, um, not, you know, not in agreement or, but I think these spaces where we have these conversations are so vital to change and they're not comfortable. They're not, they're going to be even more uncomfortable, but it's important that we keep talking. Um, Alex, um, would it be safe to um, recommend your, um, your, um, the, the name's gone out of my head now, your practice, your practice to our community for the various, not just around authority, but the various services that you provide and basically a policy of all welcome. Is that fine to promote? Yeah, of course, absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, Alex, Clive, Val, David, Sam, everybody uh, for coming and contributing. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.